Need to create a complex enterprise Angular application? Angular Bootcamp is an intensive three-day workshop class to learn the basics of Angular through sophisticated techniques for real-world applications. We target Angular 6 and the recent versions with much of the curriculum is suitable back to Angular 2. Or go beyond the three-day class with a consultation or project launch with Oasis Digital, the team behind Angular Bootcamp. We can assist your team or launch your project with advanced Angular topics including scalability, data flow, state management, full stack product design, and more. Contact us for a private class at your location or buy a ticket for public classes in various cities around the U.S. and occasionally in Europe. Online live instructor training is also available at angularbootcamp.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 200. Woo-hoo-hoo! Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, we've been doing this for about four years. Uh, kind of crazy when wow. you think about it. But that is, yeah. That is too crazy. Now, I, I'm trying to remember, Ward, were you on the original panel? I know Joe was. No, no, I, I, um, I sort of joined and you couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> like I showed course. up one day. No matter how hard I shook my laptop, you still that, that was it. that was it. So. The, the list of failed hitmen is long. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> Ward Bell, super spy, developer. Uh, who was on the original panel? I, I I'm trying to remember. I know that Joe and um, Aaron Mishko, Mishko, Igor. No, well, we had them on episode one to talk about the origin story of. Angular, but they were they were they, guests, not panelists. Yeah, they were guests, not panelists. Had Jules originally on the panel for a while, right? She came on a little bit later. And Lucas, I yeah, Lucas, Lucas was there. Was. What about JP? John, JP? yeah, he was. Was he? Was he on the original? I think so. And he's still he's still with us. He's just not yeah. with us today. Hey, yeah. all right. So I'm looking through the panelists. Wait, we don't. It doesn't list the panelists. Wait, right there. Why does I happen? know. I, you have a bug. Yeah. I, I'm looking at the same thing. Yeah. Okay. But. So, so yeah, you can, we can make up who uh, was on the like uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, Betty Crocker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we had we had uh the state George, of Marshall. We had George W. Bush and Barack Obama when they were drinking buddies. Che Guevara was one yeah. of the Che Guevara and uh, Big Daddy Pipe was one of the, <laughs> one of the first. <laughs> oh god. Captain Phasma before she was popular. There we go. <laughs> yeah, MacGyver, MacGyver before he was popular. Yep, and then and then we downgraded to MacGyver's duct tape. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a it's a an evolving panel. Yep, but yeah, we we had a good time. I it might have just been Joe and Aaron and I. I know Lucas was really really early. Oh, Aaron! Aaron was Aaron also Frost. yeah 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 yeah. So I didn't know he was on. We should talk about how we the the whole panel start the podcast started. Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, I think it was Aaron. So You're a little bit quiet too, Joe, by the way. Yeah, don't be shy. shy. Yes. Don't be shy. That's that's how I live my life. That's my motto. <laughs> don't be shy. Yeah, that's a lot better. Sorry. Uh, all right. So uh, Aaron and I came to Chuck, said we have, because we were on, we'd been doing JavaScript Java. Aaron had been doing it off and on, and I'd been doing it for quite a while. And he said, hey, Angular's getting big. We should do an Angular podcast. And Chuck said, okay, great idea. And Aaron and I, for some reason, thought that podcasts made good money. <laughs> that was the funniest part of the whole thing. Really? <laughs> we're like, yeah. We're like, Chuck, listen, if this starts making it, getting a lot of viewers and makes a lot of money, you got to like share the, share the <laughs> well. <laughs> and then Chuck was like, hey, I will be happy to split any net profits or losses with you. <laughs> losses. <laughs> losses wow so how how many checks have you got uh, well, uh we've gotten exactly zero <laughs> <laughs> well adventures in angular i think at this point pays for itself but yeah nice so it only took four years 
<laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> the return on investment. I bet Chuck has enough left over after paying for it to oftentimes take himself out to lunch at McDonald's. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, anyway, it's... It, <laughs> well, we're here first, for the love, that's for sure. The rest of it, the panelists are here for the love. But uh, the thing that Joe left out is, I think you guys came to me once or twice and I told you no. Because I didn't have time Ooh. for another show. And I was like, I don't know. And finally, I was like, okay, let's do it. Uh, the other the other issue was, though, that I didn't have a lot of experience with Angular. And I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to, you know, pull my weight. But it, it turns out that knowing how to pull the podcast together and things like that um, is a contribution all on its own. So it all kind of worked out. Yeah, you did, you did an amazing job. You hide it very well. We didn't know that you <laughs> an Angularian. That, that I have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do daily. So I have experience with that. Yeah. So yeah. you, you said no, and then like, what made you say yes? I think they just kept coming back and asking me. I know I told them no at least once. So that's the system, that's the like the way to get to you, like repeating the same question, like, hey, give me, can you give me one thousand dollars? Well, I think it was partially that, and partially that um, they convinced me that they could find the guests and things like that and make it go because I didn't have any of those connections. Yeah. Hmm. And now nice. we have dozens of viewers, dozens, dozens, <laughs> thousands even. Storming <laughs> on the internet, <laughs> but not dozens of thousands. <laughs> how many viewers? How many viewers? How many listeners do we have? Do you know? So the last time I ran the numbers, we had about eighty-five hundred downloads per episode. Ooh, I'm always surprised, people. You know, because when we talk to each other, we have no idea if there's anybody out there. Yeah, but um, I often am approached um, at a conference or on the street uh and they say uh boy i really, really like your podcast so um somebody's listening and uh, those street? of you who are on oh, the street it does not happen to you shy I, you know <laughs> <laughs> they also ask you if you have any spare change <laughs> they, that's <Nope>. the second <laughs> question <laughs> best the best story i have from the getting recognized from the podcast is when i got pulled over by a cop and he, he wanted to give me a ticket but he said hey I he heard you on the Adventures in Angular uh, podcast. No so. way. That's so great. <laughs> yeah. So you're off the hook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the way, I like React and then he ran away. <laughs> <laughs> when I can't get a table at the fancy restaurants, I drop the fact that I'm a panelist on <laughs> Adventures in Angular. Oh, they get you right in the door, doesn't it? Right, right in the door. Oh, why didn't you say so? <laughs> Come I right in. I know. Right We've had your, we have your table right here next to the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> next to the get behind lost. The, behind the, the dish sink counter. Yeah, so I, I know I told the story a couple of times. This isn't specifically about adventures in Angular, but I once uh, Jabber, yeah. had somebody, yeah, wearing the JavaScript Jabber t shirt. And so went up and I was like chatting with them <laughs> about JavaScript Jabber. And the guy had no idea that I was part of the panelist. Like, oh. Oh, that's funny. Right, like I've been on since episode twenty. Right, I'm by, I, besides uh -huh. Chuck, I am by far the most consistent panelist. Guy had yes. no idea until it was like way into it. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see that scene? Does anybody watch Modern Family? Any of you people watch Modern Family? I saw the first few seasons. Now, there's this great episode when they're the one boy wants to be a writer, and they're in this restaurant, and he recognizes some writer, and he goes over to try to talk to him. The writer's super mean to him, right? And so he's all depressed and his mom goes and yells at the kid and then he comes back and then, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name. The uh, uh, Jewish hey, guy. No, no, no. The Jewish guy who's, uh, uh, he was Miracle Max in um, Princess Bride. Oh, Billy Crystal? Billy Crystal, yes. Billy Crystal comes Jewish over. guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, to, trying to think of everything I know about him to identify who he is. I, have that, you know, I, I, that, I don't think that, no that one ever heard him. Not at all. Yeah, no, I never think of him that way, but he is. The chocolate coating makes it go down easier. <laughs> I was going to say, I think Joe's hungry and, and you know, he forgets to get him a nice MLT where the mutton is nice and lean. Lean. <laughs> so he comes over to encourage this kid and his mom, right? And he's playing himself. And and they just think he's some random bum. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, "Okay, thanks, Mister." Like, and then the, 
<laughs> like and, Crystal's doing everything it can to, to, to. He says, "Well, have fun storming the castle." <laughs> and he's like, and "Really, still nothing." Get it. Still uh, yeah. it. And he says, "I got to leave the beard." <laughs> <laughs> and he leaves, and and then the the kid says to his mom, "Who was that Jewish guy?" Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, "Who was the rabbi?" <laughs> <laughs> It's Shai Resnick. <laughs> oh, I've heard of him. Yeah, he's on the Adventures in Angular podcast. <laughs> Full circle. I love it. <laughs> so should we um, reminisce on the time that we first heard about Adventures in Angular? <laughs> sure. Yeah, let's hear some uh, fun reminiscences. Well, it, yeah. it's funny you're talking about hearing about the show. I mean, I heard about the show when we started it. So, uh, yeah, I don't get very many of these stories. That was your story. Okay, next. Elisa. <laughs> I'm pretty boring. I heard about it because of, well, NG Comp, which led me to get to know people like Joe and Don Papa and Chuck, which then just led into, hey, do you want to be on the show? But it was hilarious because I got invited. It was like the same day to be on Adventures in Angular as well as Angular Air. And so I was like, I'm so popular. <laughs> 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 no, it was, it was great. I was super excited. So yeah, that, I think that was a year ago, two years ago. I don't know. I would have to check. I'm really bad at dates and I don't know who Prince is. So there you have it. Two months. Two months. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Shay? Or oh. Ward, yeah, Ward. <laughs> yeah, Ward, Ward. Well, well, I, I, uh, I got invited as a guest at one point, and then um, another guest canceled or something like that, and I, and they said, "Who are we going to call?" Well, I, I don't know. We'll get that guy again. And before you know it, um, I was, uh, I was showing up. So I, I really, I, you know, I basically crashed the party. Is pretty much what it is. And you guys uh, have, have held held to me kept on letting me come and show and, and that's been great so and, and pretty much your one move yeah that's my that's the party <laughs> that's the party that's pretty much how i get anyway um <laughs> but it's always it's always been a fascinating ride because i i really enjoy what our guests have to say uh and then i enjoy disagreeing with them so that's uh, <laughs> you know, I, do, I really enjoy, enjoy disagreeing with joe more than anything <laughs> and so uh i you know we we get lively things going now fortunately shy and i are consistently on the same page consistently, so, right. consistently. we're writing the test before we write the code <laughs> consistently <laughs> consistently yeah well all right almost consistently <laughs> <laughs> but i just want to know i haven't been able to ask you ward have you gone to see solo oh hell no <laughs> <laughs> i mean really you know i i, uh, I had a I had a root canal scheduled for that day, and that was more pleasurable. <laughs> Sometimes I think that, like, you were just kidding, because I think... That he's, like, oh, a closet Star Wars fan? Yeah! <laughs> like, I really... Because, first, serious, when I first, like, learned that you didn't like Star Wars, I thought it was all a big joke, because my brain was like, who could not? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, anytime I hear you talk about it, I'm like, Wait, he's being serious, right? Like, there's always this like hint of sarcasm, at least that I put on you when you talk negatively about Star Wars. So. <laughs> he's always biting his tongue whenever I get any trivia wrong. <laughs> I can name every bounty hunter who's who you saw for like the 20 seconds in episode uh, five. Oh god! I wish that were so. <laughs> he knows Qui Gon Jinn's entire biography. I was going to say, one of these days, we're going to find out that Ward's like this Star Wars super geek. <laughs> and he <laughs> dresses like Yoda. He's got a Star Wars tattoo somewhere on his body that he won't remember. Ward, Ward, I want you to know that you don't have to hide it from us. This is a safe place. <laughs> this is a safe place. I can yeah, come out of like Star Wars closet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can yep. come out. This is a welcoming place. Yeah. <laughs> this is a well, safe place. I, I, but then I would, I don't. No, I really don't like Star Wars. I'm sorry. Uh, wow, uh, wow, wow. I just thought about th something like Ward, like uh, sitting in a dark theater room and starting hearing the Star Wars theme and you see like the subtitles, you know, in, in, the, in the angle, right? Uh, but yeah. In of, yeah, in the start of the, of the, of the yeah. film. And then you see like in a... Um, 
in a place far, far away when they used to test their Redux code <laughs> before they wrote it. <laughs> like all the things that Ward hates. <laughs> yeah, they come rolling. They come scrolling up there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, no, I really, uh, it's just one of those things. Um, I, I don't get that franchise. Uh, but that's, you know, that whole genre is just not my, I mean, I'll go, the odd thing is that I go to see him anyway. And then I wonder why I wasted my hours doing it, but I do it. I think it's just so <laughs> that I can have cultural references so that I can at least <laughs> what you guys are talking about. <laughs> nice. I get the jokes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's always kind of a running joke there. Um, I do want to change the topic a little bit. Uh, one thing that as I was looking through the, the, titles of the past episodes that I noticed was that we covered the transition between Angular JS and Angular. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was interesting. So a lot of those topics, it's like we're talking about alphas and betas and well, there's we only had like, we were only able to do like a couple episodes because the transition happened so smooth and fast. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That was was probably the best uh, version transition in computer science history. Oh yeah, Joe. Joe's got jokes. <laughs> like, got jokes. It was like silk. It was like silk. Like silk. Like silk. Uh, yeah, it it's uh, it didn't give us a lot of material to talk about, but um, I think this wasn't the first time. No, no, no. It wasn't the first. It was the second time I was on the show talking about like the future of Angular. Like uh, thinking that it was on 2015, I think. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, it's right around around the corner, right? It's uh, probably in the end of the year or something like that. And uh, you should all be prepared. And then it took like two years. <laughs> yeah. It's going to happen any moment now. Any second now. Yeah. Well, well, you know, maybe this is a time to say, is there is there a future for Angular? And, and, and what does that future look like? Um, Anybody got a feel for that? The future oh. for Angular is as strong as the future for Star Wars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it all comes back to that, doesn't it? Franchise, <laughs> mother lover. Does that mean um, Disney's going to acquire it? There, there's a distinct possibility of that Disney's going to buy Google. and There we go. <laughs> I, I, I think that, like, I did a talk about why I'm betting on Angular in 2016, and now it's 2018. And Angular is still staying strong. Um, so who knows, right? But I, f- I have a feeling that it's here to stay at least for a couple of years more. Um, and, and it keeps getting better and better. I'm really, really excited about like Ivy and all those changes. Um, I think it will uh, give it a different angle and much more... It, the adoption rate will be much easier, I, I believe. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm I'm hoping that's right. I haven't. Have you been paying attention to to what's going on in Ivy? Because it all sort of seems below the radar for me. Maybe that's because hmm. I'm working on I mean, writing an Angular. App. I watched a couple of talks about it, and I actually got to hang out at IO with Kara Erickson, who's been doing a ton of the writing on it. And I was actually at an after party, and some people who work at Google that don't work for the Angular team or do much with Angular, they were talking about how like they'd been disappointed with Angular in the past, but the demo uh, with Ivy was extremely impressive to them. And so I was like, well, that's good news. Mm. Like that it's, yeah. So I honestly, I've heard a ton of great things about Ivy and I'm really excited about it, but I don't know. I'm also like super like naive and gullible and like, you know, the entire web could explode tomorrow and I'd be like, well, that was a surprise. So I, (laughs) I tend to hate giving my opinions on these things because I'm always like, of course there's going to be an Angular and of course it's going to be perfect in the future. So, yeah, I don't know. I would love to hear what your thoughts are, Ward, because I feel like you kind of balance me a bit. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, it's a sincere question because, I, you know, I was very impressed by what I saw way back at NGConf and, Cara, and what Kara presented. Mm. And um, I... And then I haven't noticed a whole lot about it um, since. And I, I figured they're grinding away and grinding away and that it's going yes. to emerge. Um, but I, you know, it, the, the, the thing about all these technologies, uh, and in it myself, is that 
you get the first 80 percent really fast and then that last 20 percent just takes forever because you're dealing with all the edge cases and you're realizing where the api wasn't quite right and it just slows to a crawl and you can't get it out and i have to, that's what i always worry about with um with a new twist like like this and i I'm just hopeful that they're close to the end uh, so that, that we'll be seeing it soon because they've been talking about it for quite some time. And I wondered if any of you knew what the, whether, um, you, you know, whether you tried it and felt it was imminent um, or it's just one of those things that um, they're pushing behind the scenes and it'll emerge and we won't know until it arrives. Hmm. That's, that's an interesting question. I don't, I, I feel like, um, I don't know. It's out there, I think, because it's part of, uh, it's kind of part of six, as far as I know, no? Or like just like the demo or something like that. Just the minimal uh, things. Uh, but there's, I, I, what I know is that, what probably what you know is that uh, they're um, working hard on making it uh, backward compatible. Yeah. Um, so that's the main thing. But once it, it's it's really interesting and I'm really excited. Like uh, we're going to do a meetup on this, on next month, and Uri Shaked is going to give a lecture about it, where he dig uh, digs deep into the source code and show what's different and all that stuff. So I'm excited about that um, uh, to see his talk because I haven't got the time uh, as well to dig into it myself yet. Uh, but there are a couple of posts, good posts, I think, uh, in Angular in depth. Uh, of Max, um, mm. Max? Yeah, I, I would have expected Max to have been into it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if someone is digging deep, is Max definitely okay. not in six though? Because I wrote a post about Angular six, like and all the goodies it entailed, and mm. I had a section that was about ID, and um, they reached out and they were like, uh, like telling me they're like it's come this is before six drops and they're like it's coming but it's not going to be in six so mm. I, i had to like preface anything that i said about ivy with that so i know it's okay. not this, but yeah so seven yeah <laughs> one thing that though it, it, so there are a couple of things that i'm gleaning from this one is that um it feels like they're solving the right problems right i mean everybody's looking forward to these improvements um but you know going back to the issue of whether angular is going to continue to be a relevant technology to know I feel like that's really hard to keep our finger on. I mean, you know, we we had some sort of incumbent technologies for a long time in like jQuery, right? I mean, it was kind of the way to go for 10 years. And it feels like, you know, now we have the next generation of things that we kind of evolved up to through um, things like Backbone and Knockout and Ember, you know, and now we're, we're working in this paradigm that's pretty similar across Vue and React and Angular where we're using these components and we're using some of the same patterns. I mean, there are definite differences between the frameworks, but but the way that we kind of organize things is is fairly similar. And I think that's going to be the incumbent technology, um, you know, as, as we move forward. But again, you know, does WebAssembly change the, the equation where people start using whatever backend language they use with a front-end compiler to WebAssembly? Or, you know, is there some other technology that's going to come along that's not really on our radar yet that people are going to look at and go, you know what, this is way superior to anything we currently have in the other frameworks. It's, it's just, it's interesting to think that, you know, given what we know right now, I don't see any reason why the Angular community would, um, I, I guess people would move away from it in numbers that would affect the Angular community. But you never know what's going to come up next either. And yeah. and I think I think that's the real threat. If there's a threat, and we're worried about there being a threat to Angular, is that you know, I think it's going to be some technology that we don't really know about yet that's going to come in and affect things in a way that we don't foresee. But well, what, and I what think that's a, definitely a possibility. But I also think like how many technologies are still hanging on, and we look at it and we're like, why are people still using you? Like, so. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think I don't yeah, think but, it's the case for for Angular because. Uh, at least from my point of view, because what, what you're saying is that if there will be a better technology, let's say, it will leave it also like the other, yeah, right? right? So it's yes. not an Angular thing. And the, the, the case I see for Angular is that currently, at least currently, I know the other frameworks are working on that as well, but or the other ecosystems. 
currently Angular is the only uh, framework that I know that like sa- says it uh, out from the get-go that they are dealing with the enterprise level products, like they're large scale products. And uh, that's not, um, that's m- maybe Vue is also like aiming for that, but, um, uh, and, and I, I'm sure that in one year or two years time, like, um, the other ecosystems, all the other ecosystems will, will have some sort of a solution for like large scale. But I think that having that as a main goal on the roadmap or on the, as a, a beacon, um, that separates Angular currently. And I, f- I feel that that's what, uh, probably, uh, gave it like the, um, I don't know, maybe lack of, uh, f- 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 I don't know, being the fashionable um, thing for startups because it was focused on the large scale, like the let's let's give you all the things that you need in order to you know complete the whole picture, and um, and and the fact that there are there are like good alternatives, uh, whether it's React or Vue or whatever will come next. Um, this is a very very good thing. And I, I remember at NGConf, I think 2015, um, I think they said that the core team said that they're, they're looking at it as a friendly competition, mm-hmm. which means that we can w- all work together and uh, get inspired by each other and collaborate. But the fact that there is a competitiveness to the whole thing makes everyone better because it, things are not getting stuck or, uh, you know, into this like uh, comfort zone where everything is, uh, you know, we have the market share, let's say, and we don't need to move that fast or something like that. So that's what make it, makes it an interesting thing. And that's why I feel like as long as the Angular team is in this competitive mode, and as long as we have large products in Google that using <laughs> Angular... Uh, and also la- large scale, you know, companies that are using it. Uh, I feel that it's here to stay for at least for a couple of years. Yeah, I think I think like I said before, I don't think it's going to be some technology that, you know, if if we start doing things in a different way that you know, materially departs from the way that Angular or any of the other frameworks work. I think it's going to be a new paradigm of things, and and that's that's ultimately where people have moved away from. Uh, jQuery, and there's still a lot of people using jQuery, but you know that's where we've seen a lot of these companies move uh, their technology stack off of something like jQuery and onto something like Angular. And so it's it's going to be some new way of thinking about the problems that we're solving, or some change in in the the fundamental stack that forces us to move into a different way of thinking about our problems. Well, you know, Chuck, the Web Assembly one might. That that's a force. I don't know if it'll ever take off, but at least it's different and it has a reason for why you might want to go down that road. I don't mm-hmm. hear. A, there's nothing I hear within the sort of let's build something that runs JavaScript in the browser that that sounds even remotely like an, a, a competitor to the three. And each, I if agree. you think about the three, that you see what they each have um, that makes them distinct. Um, and makes them competitive with each other. Uh, but I don't know how anybody else slides in there. Um, I, don't, I don't either, but uh, I, I, don't know, I, don't know that, I don't know that people really saw, you know, these other technologies coming in in the way that they did. Uh, that's, that's true, but they, it would take a real force to dislodge I these agree. three. I completely uh, agree. Well, again, what were the three? Uh, Angular, React, and Vue. Okay. Cool. To my mind, to my mind, those are the ones, you know, I mean, uh, I, I'm sorry for the Ember people. Uh, I know how it, uh, they much they love it. Um, and uh, they uh, have a, you know, they have their their, their niche where they're strong. Uh, and I'm not saying, I'm not making a claim that, uh, that uh, about the merits of the, the relative merits of the framework. I'm just simply saying that from a, um, from a, um, a dominant, like if you had to tell some a new business what to pick, you could tell them comfortably to pick any of those three, and then they would find plenty of support. Uh, and I, I couldn't make that claim in, on Ember. Um, if you already knew Ember, that would be something. And, but if you did wanted you say to, do, <laughs> did I say that? I wouldn't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. You just invented the word. I, I heard what 
I heard oh, you. okay. My bad. My bad. I was like, he's being all proper. I don't know. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. And so, anyways, you were saying if you already know Ember. Yeah, you <laughs> shan't be able to find support. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you know, there's no reason to... to to you know, to do jQuery or Backbone or, or Knockout or or Aurelia, to, to, to name another one that was promising at one time. Uh, I, at one point, I thought, uh, and I know Joe, you thought that something would emerge out of the Elm community, but uh, Elm doesn't seem to have expanded its circle at all. Do you think? <laughs> um, no, I mean, like what we're talking about here is the big three as far as like popularity, vibrancy, and maybe you know a popular. Uh, future, right? So I would agree with that assessment that these are likely to, you know, between the three of them, if you look at projects that are going to use a front end framework of some kind, that those three probably are going to occupy 90 plus percent of the market share for the next couple of years. Um, but I think so, you're absolutely the point here is, in my opinion, correct. I think there's a lot of interesting things going on, and, and Elm sits in that place where. It may or may not by itself, it, it's unlikely based on its recent track record to come and take over a large piece of the market share. And one of the reasons for that is that Evan Chaplicki, who is the main owner of Elm, has, wants to keep a very tight rein on Elm. So there's like some really important issues uh, that have existed for just a really long time. And because he doesn't feel like he's come up with what is the right best solution, he's just not solving them rather than letting the, you know, opening it up and either responding to their demands of, hey, this is important to a lot of people, so you need to address this. And so coming up with whatever is the best solution right now, he wants Elm to be a very beautiful, uh, holistic type of a thing. And so he doesn't want to solve a problem until he feels like he's got the right solution to the problem. And that's definitely holding it back from market share. But it also, on the, on the, conserv- on the other side, it's, there's like a, there was a book called uh, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks was a fantastic book to work through because you learn seven different computer programming languages that were so vastly different from each other that really opened up your eyes to new things. And so I think Elmas sits in that place where educationally, it's really interesting. And there's certainly some businesses that are going to find that, hey, this is going to be the right tool for us. But it's really interesting to look at it from an educational standpoint because as an example, it's really close to the Reason ML language, which is starting to gain some popularity in React. And mm-hmm. that can help you understand why it's gaining popularity in React, um, even if you don't yourself do React, and to see there's some parallels going on there between Elm and React and even TypeScript. Um, And uh, there's another framework out there that I think is super cool and interesting to learn about. I don't think that it's necessarily going to gain much traction other than some niche uses, but it's called Svelte. And that's a framework where there is no runtime that goes down to the browser. So, you know, in Angular, we've got the... uh, uh, they just the AOT compiler, the head of time compiler. That it used to be that that was an option. Now it's uh, it happens by default through the CLI, but where it compiles a bunch of stuff uh, so that you send less of your framework down to the browser. Well, Svelte sends zero framework down to the browser. You're still authoring in what feels like a framework, but when it's all done, it is literally just raw DOM manipulation and no. There's like of your download package size, zero bytes is a framework library that comes along in order to run certain things, which is really interesting. You know, their whole, her, their hello world is literally a few hundred bytes. So kind of, you know, interesting stuff that other people are putting out. So I think the word, but what I don't think we can anticipate is something the way, like what Angular did to the industry, right? Um, where we had Backbone, uh, we had jQuery, And even Backbone itself and Knockout were uh, also very novel. But Angular came along and packaged everything up in a new and unique way. And nobody just, nobody thought of it before. And all of a sudden, wow, here's something we're going to take and do what we've been doing on the back end. We're going to do it on the front end. And nobody thought to do that. And so who knows what is going to happen in a few years when somebody else comes along with a super novel idea that might might just decimate the big three. Deploy more, pay less with DigitalOcean, the simplest all-in-one cloud computing platform for developers. Scale and run cloud applications faster and more efficiently with effortless administration tools to robust compute, 
flexible configurations, networking services, real-time alerts, and rapid provisioning while enjoying industry-leading price-to-performance with a flat pricing structure across all global data center regions at any usage volume. Spend more time building better web apps and less time worrying about managing infrastructure with DigitalOcean. Build your next app on DigitalOcean. Get started with a free $100 credit at do.co slash adventures. Yeah, it would take some kind of change on the on the on the available technology. I think, you know, the the thing that was interesting about it. I remember Angular JS. Why I switched to it from the other things, which was that it was radically simpler than the alternatives, uh, as well as being comprehensive. Uh, it was way simpler than Ember, way simpler and more capable than Backbone. Knockout only covered part of the situation, and it required mm-hmm. that you have objects that were. Um, that, that because it was event driven, you ha, you know all the properties had to have this hidden stuff that it built in, and so you had overhead of building the, that up and wondering what was going on, and it just seemed like wow, here's Angular, and you drop it on the page and go. Um, yeah, well, that's no longer the case, uh, but it was radical then, right. uh, and Vue has kind of taken on that sort of uh, we're the ultra easy way to get going, and you don't have to learn so much. Um, and that's why it's made huge inroads. Uh, whether that's in fact true or not for building the kinds of applications we want to build, it it certainly uh, has that cl- claim it, uh, to radical simplicity that you cannot say is true uh, for Angular anymore. Uh, right. And you can't say it's true for React a- anymore either. Uh, and I think there's an interesting uh, piece to, comp- to consider about all these three, and that is that they're all just kind of different flavors of the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. They're all sol- you know, they solve it in a different way, and, and the people may bicker a lot over those minimal differences, but in the end, uh, they're far more like each other than they are like jQuery, for example, or Backbone. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that the component uh, issue is basically done, uh, like the pro- component structuring the components, you know, with nested components and stuff like that. Those are the flavors. I think that in terms of data management, uh, this is, I think, yet... uh, That's wide open. That's wide open. Yeah. Yeah, wide open. It's not not so... It's like state management. Yeah, it's like you have Redux, which took off, like it exploded. but and, And I feel like it migrated like to all the... Three or all three, mm-hmm. but I still don't feel that um, this is the silver bullet, and I feel that there's a lot of work to be done in th- this field, especially in like maintaining large and complex uh, uh, products. And uh, this is where the innovation, I think, uh, could come. Uh, and not, I don't feel that it will come in the component because. Basically, we have a component. It has inputs, outputs. You know, it's kind of isolated. Uh, you can isolate it. You don't have the leaky dollar scope parent, parents that uh, you had in Angular JS and uh, and and React. Uh, the, the innovation that React brought to the table um, was in that like it solved the problem that Angular JS had, and that's why also Angular um, adopted it and also Vue. So now we have that problem. I feel like it's solved, and I feel like the the other stuff, which is the like you know the performance stuff and state management and all that stuff, those are where the innovation uh, could uh, innovation could come from. So yeah, unless the browsers change, you know, if the browsers change, and that's why WebAssembly is a wild card because if the brow, you know, if the whole if that really takes off. And then you can bring, you know, people in other language communities can deliver to the browser effectively. Um, then, then you've got a new avenue to do something. Or if the browser suddenly adopted uh, a component, you know, something that said, "All right, well, since everybody's building spas, let's really make the brow- let's give the browser a foundation for doing that." If that were to happen, that would be a um, uh, pretty big move. I mean, we're we're trying to look into the crystal ball, but that yeah. that's that's the way it looks. So, so um, people still ask me, like, would you, you know, for a new project, would you pick Angular or React or Vue? And 
Um, I, you know, I know we try and not, we're not trying to trash anything, but I, I, I kind of, and of course my predominant experience is in Angular, so it's really not fair for me to judge this stuff too much, but I still feel that there are certain things about Angular that keep me home, uh, that the others, uh, maybe they, you can bolt them on, but they aren't central to what makes, makes them tick. And, um, so for me, some of the, you know, I'm kind of curious what others think, uh, but I'll give you the top reasons why I, I keep steering people to Angular, uh, um, which is, you know, it starts with TypeScript is everywhere throughout. Um, and, and that everybody I know who's played with this feels that that is a, a, uh, a game changer. The TypeScript, having types makes a huge difference in the productivity when you're building an application. And yes, you can bring TypeScript to the others, but it's not, um, it's not absolutely central to, to doing it. And when you look around at, uh, at React code and, and view code, um, most of what you see and learn about isn't in TypeScript, whereas it's impossible in Angular to not have TypeScript. It's always TypeScript. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's been a big one for me. The other big one for me um, is dependency injection. Uh, the others don't have it. Again, you can bolt it on, um, but I <laughs> I don't know how I live without it. Uh, I'm kind of curious what you guys think. That's uh, that's I, an interesting point, you know, uh, Ward. I, I've been thinking about it a lot um, about dependency injection because I, I, I'm I'm used to it so much, and I you know I do everything, and especially uh, in terms of uh, testing, uh, it's it's a huge deal. But you see a lot of you know React um, applications w- which they are uh, using Jest, which uh, m- monkey patches the require behind the scene, uh, and then they can like you know stub it out with with something different, and that's basically um, remove the need for uh, dependency injection in terms of testing. Um, it's not. I feel it's not, um, you know, it's not that elegant, but at the same time, Zone.js also <laughs> does it, you know, to the browser for change detection, right? So it's not, uh, nothing is pure, right? Uh, but it, it's an interesting point. I, I, I don't know. I'm, on the, I'm in the middle. I feel it's so important in the way, not for tough, I mean, testing is certainly one of the benefits of it, but it's so, I find it so important as a way of making, um, tying together the pieces, um, not having, uh, uh, I mean, just architecturally to be able to decouple things and not having to assume that something that you want is lying around, uh, in the global space. Um, which is pretty much what they do, right? You know, you want H- you want HTTP. Well, you know, you put this library up there, and you pull, you pluck it out of. Uh, if you're going to use it, you're plucking it out of out of um, the the global namespace, uh, mm-hmm. as far as I can tell. Uh, and if you write anything, it's essentially there. You import it, and, and that puts it in your your. It's in a namespace, and uh, yeah, you can namespace it, but that's no way to. Um, swap things around in order to. It's not a creation pattern. I just don't know how. I don't know. Namespace, but the namespace it's, it is the file file itself. No, it's the file location. This is the, basically when you require your car from a certain place. Right, okay. but that means I'm locked into the thing that was implemented there. I can't. Uh, I can't swap it uh, dynamically. Uh, uh, yes, I'm and that, that, that's you know that that's a good debate for a, a dependency injection episode because. I, again, I've been thinking about it a lot, and basically, the the amount of time that I needed to go and swap uh, an implementation was uh, I basically needed to swap it anyway with an interface or with an abstract class or something, you know, as a mediator or something in between, um, and 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 that's basically what you can do with a wrapper or something like that if you just require, so we change the require or something like that, but that's. That's I, I feel like we're you know we're we're going into this um, uh, debate about dependency injection, which might not be related to the whole episode, but maybe maybe not. Well, can I, I um, go ahead? Can I jump in and back us off to another point that you mentioned, Ward, that I'd like to jump in on? Sure. Uh, I really like what you were talking about with the TypeScript 
is it's kind of integral integration. So I've been doing some view lately and I wanted to do view with TypeScript. So I went through the effort of getting view writing and it was actually more, quite a bit on the painful side, right? Well, not terribly painful, but t- painful enough. And there just wasn't quite enough documentation and their official documentation mostly is not built around TypeScript. They do mention, you know, that it's supported and how, they talk a little bit about how to do it, but I kind of had to look at some third-party blogs. So it was a little bit painful. What I like about Angular and its TypeScript integration is the fact that it's there, it's first class, it, you can't do it without it. But because TypeScript itself is so, you know, zero optional overhead, other than the two two kinds of things, you know, decorators, which you absolutely need for uh Angular to work anyway, and then types for the dependency injection. That it's just so nice because I feel like I have TypeScript. I can start using it anytime I want, but I can mostly ignore it if I don't care. If I'm doing a small little project and types are just not going to give me a big benefit, I don't want to spend time coming up with interfaces and defining a bunch of types and worrying about the return types of a bunch of stuff, then no big deal. I just use any everywhere I want to. And it's it's zero friction to start using it. Uh, when I want to, where in something else, if I start off with JavaScript, moving to TypeScript is a fair amount harder. You know, there's all of a sudden some friction. It becomes a decision point, a much bigger decision point than it would be in Angular. So that's one of my favorite things about Angular. Although I would say that on the dependency injection side, I'm kind of on the Lashai side on the meh, one way or the other. I could get, leave it or take it. And then I, there's, I'm going to want to mention the piece that I really don't like about Angular, which is zone. Yeah, I don't like zone. Sounds a thorn in my side. I'm sure that it, I mean, it's got all kinds of cool things. And when it comes to testing, the fact that you can use fake zones in your testing to make async code synchronous is actually really cool. But when I'm actually using Angular and my stack traces include 55 layers of zone. <laughs> I know. That's what I'm hoping to see less of with IAV, I have to say. Yeah. Um, this the transparency that, um, that I think IAV may bring to it will be one of its benefits to us as developers um another thing that you're that you're kind of always got hanging around your angular app which is uh is rxjs and um you know i've gotten to like that but i <laughs> it's taken a while. that way yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, I i feel like it's a, i feel a love hate like i want to love it and it's more complex and it has it's cool enough that i don't hate it but it's weird enough and hard enough that sometimes I struggle with it. But it's unlike Zone, I really feel the benefits of it when I'm doing some stuff with it. But like Zone, sometimes I'm just like, ah, oh, this is, how do I do this crap? Uh, and the one thing I'm really struggling with lately is just error handling well in Rx, a nice, solid error handling pattern for RxJS. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, feel I actually that, yeah. recently jumped into um, our NGRX and RxJS for the first time. I've gotten by this this long with not learning any of that. And so over the last few weeks, I've just been like deep diving into it. And so for a, from a noob's perspective, from someone who knows Angular but didn't know how to react to program, at first it was just like, um, grit your teeth and bear it. It was literally like, a, you just need to learn this. And then once you learn it, you can judge it. Um, I still say I'm in the learning phase because I don't think you can learn fully in GRX and RxJS in two weeks. But, <laughs> but I oh, sure Alyssa. gave it my darndest. I'm not really? even it's been a hellacious. We're taking thing. your we're taking your credentials away. It's, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. It's I see the benefits of it, um, but it, it feels like, especially from someone who like came from Angular JS and was just like, "Gosh, that was just like the bee's knees." Um, it just feels like so much effort mm-hmm. and I'm I'm trusting in people who have paved the way and who are saying this is the best way to do it I'm trusting in those people because right now I don't see it yet I, Just, yeah that's 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 a that's a point that you know for me at least I I was in the like you I think uh, Ward was in the Google group where they debated whether to edit or not and in what amount and stuff like that and I feel that still it has like, it's very good for certain scenarios. And the fact that we have this separation of concepts uh, between like uh, how, I don't know, declarative uh, uh, or 
um, like you declare your or you bind to the template in one way, which is not reactive, right? When you bind to a you know a, a method, let's say, uh, just like you know, and it's very simple to do that, right? You don't need to subscribe or unsubscribe. You don't need to you know. But then again, you need. It's kind of a, like you you uh, learn you learn two things to do. Uh, basically to handle uh, reactive things like events uh, and 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 they are not connected uh, as of now so you you cannot uh, you know say hey I want to subscribe to this click without like violating you know the <laughs> the principle of like separating the template from the comp- uh, from or the component class right um, and that's kind of like something that could have been maybe a smoother integration if you could just like you know start operating on a component or a, just a element and subscribe to its clicks and then like you know do this operation you can but it's not like the natural way you learn uh how to do it when you learn angular and i still with all that i feel that that with all the operators and the caching and, you know, hot and cold and all those stuff, it's kind of like learning, you know, rocket, rocket surgery uh, in order to sometimes doing simple <laughs> stuff, right? Are there such things as rocket surgery? Yeah, my, my cousin is a rocket surgeon. Oh uh, my God, yes. And, uh, <laughs> in, in Israel, they make heavy use of rockets on the surgery tables. It's, it's yeah. a book, actually. <laughs> I don't know if I've read that. It's a book, yeah. Uh, so, so I feel like still you have a lot to learn in order, and sometimes in order to just do simple things, like you can use a promise if you just need, you know, one time JSON data, and you don't I'm need to tell Ben Lesh that you said that. <laughs> I, I, I told I told him many times before, so he wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but. Um, I don't. That's my take on on arcs. I, I I I'm still learning it as well. And it took took me, Pete, and Mike, I think, three months to prepare a twenty minute talk to uh, explain one operator. <laughs> <laughs> Something so. that as I like started learning about this though that I'm really curious about because it was actually I think it was Bonnie who told me, and you can tell me if this is wrong, but like, and I think Shai, you just mentioned it that like Angular's like now built with ArcGIS. Is this true? Mm-hmm. Pretty well like, threaded through. It's threaded through. I mean, there, you can't. You okay. Know, so you use, you so use, it's there. You want to use uh, the router? It's there. You wanna, yeah. The, the router. So does is, this mean is, that like one day I will no longer have to learn NGRX or Redux patterns? I'll just be learning Angular, and that stuff will be part of Angular. Is that what that means, no, or is that no, not no. that? Means? So let's separate RxJS from NGRX because. NGRX uses RxJS, but it's right. um, but it's not part of RxJS, and it's not part of Angular, and it shouldn't be. Um, I think um, I think we can all. <laughs> I mean, you know, the teams or the people can get say, you know, we go we play well together, but uh, uh, that the NGRX cannot be the uh, the answer for state management. It just can't. Uh, it's an answer. It's one answer, but it can. It, it's not going to work for. Uh, yeah, for everybody. Actually, I actually had an interesting conversation with uh, Rob uh, Warmold about it, uh, about how we're missing something in in Angular in the Angular community. I feel which is like one maybe a place to. Uh, I don't know, con- uh, concentrate um, or like to um, show all the popular solutions for problems. Uh, maybe a, a, a repo or maybe like a community repo that, you know, um, show you all the all the popular solutions. And that, that could be like, a, I don't know, something more community driven effort rather than you know the core team driven effort because they mm-hmm. have their their uh, things well uh, i i agree with you Shai. and and particularly when it comes to state management this is something that you have to have build applications to find out how it works you mm-hmm. cannot do it on the basis of i got a nifty framework and i can make it you know i can yeah uh, the to do list uh, doesn't hold up 
you've got to build things with it and and find the patterns for it. And I I've been I've been living this life for the last six months, and uh, I I can tell you I it's not it's not clear how to build applications this way. Uh, I knew how to build it with Breeze, um, but I'm I'm struggling. Um, and so, so it, it would be you were saying really, separating in GRX from RxJS. Yeah, Does RxJS, that mean that like? Oh, you continue. Sorry. So well, RxJS is no, no. Yeah, I don't want to say no problem, but what I mean is it's it's um, because it's clearly <laughs> it's clearly a challenge, but it's uh, it does its one thing, and I think we know how. I think we know what it does and how it plays and, and what the patterns are for using it. Um, so there's stuff to learn there about it and the ways, you know, things you have to do to get comfortable, but it addresses a problem, mainly that you were going to have things, you know, what, what to do with data that's pushed at you. Um, and it, it, it does it well. The, uh, how you manage state in your application, though, is just a different question, and it's tricky. It's always been tricky, and the people NGR says and, and, and Redux, it's also the same thing. Haven't been around long enough for people to know how to build um, sizable applications with them. So, do you think that Angular will one day answer this question for people, or is it always going to be something that you choose to do your own way? I think it's a community thing. I believe until it will be vetted or until it will be tested as Ward says, uh, like Furious from now on a large, large scale projects where they will have like, um, you know, proofs that you're, you won't need to rewrite the whole thing (laughs) once you get to a certain point or, you know, you get stuck or you suffer of like, you know, maintenance nightmare, uh, when you get to it. And, and, and what Ward says is, and I agree, that I feel that first it will be probably be like uh, something like a community driven thing. Like you can think about the UI router as an example, where it wasn't like officially by the, you know, the core team because the router was too basic, but the UI router took off as a community project because it uh, handled, you know, it gave a much uh, better solution to the problem. Uh, And then they adopted you know, ideas from the, from it, like nested routing and all that stuff into the, you know, version two router. Um, so probably if it will happen, it will happen until there will be a proof, I feel, that something is, you know, and I think NGRX is, is adopted, is well adopted, is one of the more popular um, libraries out there. But then again... I'm I'm keep asking everyone who talks with me about NGRX. I keep you know st- uh, gathering statistics about how big is your project, how many are in the team, how many components, how many screens, how many you know. Trying to figure out um, does it hold up at large scale and is it fun to work with and all that that stuff. And the boilerplate is not too much, you know. All that stuff, and I, I'm not getting the answers that I feel will, you know, move me towards that solution for my, you know, uh, large scale uh, projects. Yeah, um, we should do a show on this. Uh, I, you know, you know, I've been working on this NGRX data thing, which is an attempt to eliminate all of the um, boilerplate, and I've been building an application with it, and. You know, I, um, I would absolutely love to hear everything. Yeah, because especially as a noob, like uh, to me, it, it's easy to get it all muddled in the beginning. And so I would love to hear any anything you guys think about it or you've experienced so far with it. So. Well, uh, I, I can say I cut out the boilerplate problem, but I'm left with a whole bunch of others. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's what I'm uh, that's what I'm struggling with. And one by one, I'm surrendering. I'm saying, well, you know, that can't. That's maybe the pure way, but that's not the way it's going to uh, go because you'll die. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before, but I, the other night I was talking about that. I was at a, at a meetup. I was presenting on it, and people came. You know, they came up to me and they showed me their NGRX projects, and they just had, oh, you know, thousands of files. Um, they just opened it up and showed me, and it was like. <laughs> You gotta be kidding! And they said, "Yeah, this is a problem." So, so uh, people have tried files like 
Oh, but like just dedicated to, just, just, just dedicated to the NGRX um, oh, um, mechanisms. Okay. All right. So they were really curious about this, you know, my the NGRX data because that all those files go away. Um, but you know, you know, you know, it was easy for them to get lost <laughs> in the morass. Uh, and so, yeah, I and I didn't solicit this. They just walked up to me and opened up their laptop and said, "Take a look at this." So um, maybe they're doing it wrong, okay? Um, but who could tell? Uh, um, but, but but again, I think that this is like a good material. Chuck, I hope you wrote it as a future episode. Uh, uh, I I feel like as a two hundred episode, like to celebrate it. I feel before we I don't know end end it up or something like that. We should probably talk about like the craziest experiences on the show. <laughs> so far if you remember like fun memories or something like that craziest favorites mine are always my banter with ward and anything where two of us disagree on something those are always my favorite episodes yeah we we've had a couple of really good ones between lucas and ward on ngrx so <laughs> yeah i remember <laughs> one of my favorite episodes <laughs> I think one of my favorite recent memories is we had uh, Jesse Sanders from Brebug come on and talk about NGRX. And Lucas was not able to be on the show, but Ward was going to be on. And Jesse gets this email from Lucas. I don't, Lucas and <laughs> Jesse oh, yeah. Lucas, right? He gets this email from Lucas beforehand saying, just got to warn you about Ward. <laughs> <laughs> just sees this. I went into this thing super nervous, like I, I was practically shaking, like, oh my gosh, this guy's oh all God. over me. <laughs> and I Word, that, how does that make you feel that people have warning emails <laughs> about well, you? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know. We're going to have one of the execs from uh, Lucasfilm on. <laughs> I'm going to send him a yeah, warning. You know, just so you know. <laughs> well, give him some. So now I really want to go on. Uh, by the way, I want everybody to know, I like, I really like NGRX. I think it's fascinating. I think it's well done. I, you know, I, uh, and I'm joining the team, right? You know, so just, uh, they hate us to get out of here uh, yeah. without, without thinking that, that, but we have to acknowledge that, that we're, uh, and we're all um, we're all learning about how to make use of this stuff. Yeah. Well, and I don't want to um, say the wrong, imply the wrong things about this because one, I feel like that ended up being one of our better episodes to yeah. begin with. You know, it's a hot topic. Yeah. It's an important topic. And two, I think it really benefits us when we don't just nod our heads. And sometimes as panelists, and I assume the other panelists feel this way, but it's just it's definitely I feel this way. We'll get guests on that will say things that I don't agree with uh, or I would like to challenge. And I sometimes, you know, oftentimes and most of the time hold myself back just because they're here to talk about what it is they're here to talk about. And I don't, I'm not here to tell them I think that their ideas are stupid or what they're doing is stupid, right? <laughs> or here I to like that about you, Joe. I, like, I wish I yeah. could be like you. I have to tell but, them. <laughs> but no, I, I know, think you're stupid, them. Joe. <laughs> same way word like for the most part you, you may be a little bit more than me but you have not come on let a guest come on and just told them that they're stupid you you may be a little bit more likely to challenge but that's why i like it when we have episodes that have more of the panelists talking about what they want because we're a lot more free to challenge each other uh, because the relationships that we have to able to say, I disagree. Like the, the, the episode on TDD, right? That was a great episode uh, mm. because we had diff people on different sides of the of the, the uh, issue and we could go back and forth. I love those types of episodes far more. So yeah, my favorites are more. always me and Ward either on different sides or on the same side of something going off about it. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy those too. And I, you know, I, I love Alyssa's take on things. Uh, I, I'm so glad yeah. that you're on the show because you surprised me. Um, uh, and I, with I my ignorance. Uh, no, we, we, I should surprise you with my ignorance. No, 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 no. You, you know, you, you come at with uh, sort of this uh, uh, fresh look that um, uh, we desperately need. I think uh, that's something that me and me and Bonnie have been working on is. Um, I, it's hard sometimes when, and it's not that I don't want to be like, like, you know, you guys are saying, oh, like we have differing opinions. It's just that 
it's hard for me to share sometimes when my opinion is ignorance. And so um, Bonnie's been encouraging me lately of just like, who cares? Who cares if they think you're stupid? Who cares what the world thinks? She's like, it's better to like actually interject questions and get out there with them. And so even I struggle still with that of like being like, you know what? I, I don't know what this is used for or what you guys are talking about. Like for instance, with Zone, I've never have yet to get to that point in my Angular JS life. And so I'm like making notes of like, go look at zone issues on like GitHub or Stack Overflow. <laughs> but that that's what I, that's why what I love about you, Elisa, that um, you're making leaps, you know, compared to someone who who is afraid to ask the question, you know, or get stuck in the, the, the its place. Uh, I feel that asking questions and being like uh, humble, you know, and and just asking whatever comes to, uh, to mind, that's the best way I learned how to learn. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and I've had I people come up to me shy and say things like, I'm so glad you asked that question on that episode. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Because they're like, I had no idea either. So I know there are listeners out there that are in the uh, earlier stages as am I. And I want you all to know that uh, you're not alone. And I'm still working on breaking out of my uh, shy box. <laughs> hey. Uh, so funny when... <laughs> Well, keep it keep it up because your fearlessness in asking these questions in a very approachable way is one of my favorite parts of this show. Mm-hmm. Well, and and I can identify with this too. When I started Ruby Rogues seven years ago, I was I'd been doing Ruby for like two years or three years, and it was the same kind of thing, right? I would ask these kinds of questions, and it helped other people. But I figured out that I was leveling up extremely quickly. Because if, if there was a hole in my knowledge, it would get filled by experts that were on the show to talk about a particular topic. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I hope, I hope people are taking heart from this in their everyday lives, too. Because the, it's the same thing that you're saying, Chuck, but like in your day job, right? Like if you're sitting mm-hmm. there yep. looking at code that one of your coworkers wrote, and it takes you, you know, a day or two to figure it out. At some point, you have to speak up and be like, "What is this?" <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's just, it's and the it way never to go stops, Lisa. It never stops. <laughs> it never stops. Yeah. Never. Really? Never. No, I don't believe never. that. Ward, ne- it never stops. Never. Like Ward, Ward, never. Never. Ward, seriously, stops. though. <laughs> I, every day, I open the code and I say, "Who wrote this?" <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was all. It, it's usually me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it never stops. Uh, and really, it, so like, because I'm on like you know weekends and night duty, like studying and learning and playing around with code to try and still level up. So you can't tell me, Ward, that you're on weekend and night duty to keep up with things or to even like reach yes, this I level. Of- sometimes yes, and sometimes we just get uh, you know frustrated and just don't do the night thing because we gave up. <laughs> Yeah, but, and, and then you switched to changed, you. Yeah, we know how this. And we changed our. I changed an opinion on about how to do something six or seven times. You know, um, mm. uh, you know, like I, 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 I'll give you a trailing example, and we're coming to the end. But you know, I'm going back and forth on reactive forms versus template driven forms. Basically, I'm back to template driven and using ng model. Uh, <laughs> but I can't tell you that I know the answer. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, you bring up what's the zones and then you're going to see us all, you know, everybody have an opinion on it. On what. <laughs> so <laughs> these, things, these things are not something, about, uh, you know, when you bring something up like this, it's uh, we're all bringing them up ourselves and, and having our own encounters with them. DI, we brought that up earlier in this session where people right. have, uh, uh, you know, what is DI? You can ask that question and what good, what good is it? When do you use it? And you'll suddenly see, I'll see in myself that the things that I held for certain up until the very moment we had the conversation suddenly come un- become uncertain and it never stops. Mm-hmm. And that's a good and thing. Also, remember that a lot of people that... Um, make arguments uh, in meetups or in, you know, even in podcasts. And um, sometimes they, they are echoing the mm-hmm. thoughts they heard like last week, you know, yep. but, mm-hmm. but they sound like, you know, they, they've been thinking about it like for years. Right. But <laughs> it often, and, and I know I do it as well. Right. But <laughs> it's yeah, we're professionals like, at it. Shy. That's your job. And in some sense, my job. <laughs> they sound like we know what we're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> Emphasis sounds like. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, maybe maybe it gets easier then. Like the you know constantly keeping up. 
Can you at least say that, that it's gotten easier for you to keep up? Nope. <laughs> you have no encouragement on that? Okay, thanks. Man. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you that it's easier to keep up. I can't, I, t- I don't feel that way at all. <laughs> Okay. It's, um, I feel that you, with time, you get a be- better habits onto what to focus on rather than to trying to learn everything, which is a disease I feel that I had <laughs> for a long time mm-hmm. and it made my life a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to focus on, so I decided I'm going to focus on front end, which is a big, <laughs> a big uh, topic by itself, but. I'm not, I completely like left the backend world and all that, you know, all that stuff just to focus on, uh, on front end. Um, so I'm not worrying about missing the newest features in node and, you know, the latest, uh, state management solution or the database, latest database or GraphQL or whatever. I just focus on sending that HTTP request and that's it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think you just embrace the fact that you're going to be, um, feeling around in the dark a fair amount. And and that's, it it takes a while to get comfortable that that's the way it's going to be. Um, Mm. and you actually do end up knowing something and you're, and you're the older, you're leading somebody else, but, um, it's, it's part of the nature of this. Mm. So, So welcome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> all right well i'm going to push this over to picks i know that uh we will we've been talking for about an hour and 20 minutes and uh nobody wants that, to hear yeah, that at least stuff 10 to minutes to, of it so. was, was useful yeah <laughs> i hope you can get the editor to find that 10 yeah <laughs> <laughs> before we get to the <laughs> picks <laughs> I want to, to, to say that uh, a big, big thank you to you, Chuck, for keeping this um, up. Keeping it alive, yeah. Yeah, for so long, four years. Wow, that's a lot. And uh, I hope uh, we keep on doing it until uh, Angular Less Commit is on GitHub. Well, I don't have any plans to stop, so... Nice. Keep it up. And, and give us the checks that you promised. <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do our picks. Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere. Available from any device. Uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android... And all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love. And you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Joe, do you want to start us off with picks? Yes, I do. I will start us off with picks. I got three picks today. Um, I want to keep mentioning this because I... Still keep being excited about it. At the Framework Summit this fall, we're going to be having a special creator summit. Angular team, React team, member team, Elm team, Vue team, all together the day before the conference for them to work from with each other and learn from each other. I'm super excited about that. <clears throat> and we will uh, uh, be giving some kind of a public report from the results of that meeting as well. So come check it out. I mean, it's not a public event, but come check out the Framework Summit as well. It'll be awesome and get to see some keynotes from the Angular team as well. The other, my other picks, uh, the movie A Quiet Place just came out on video. Saw it twice in the theater with my daughter. Absolutely loved it. Just like yeah, such yes. an innovative piece of filmmaking, you know? <laughs> such awesome. a good movie. Did you see it, Ward? No, I want to. I really like what I've read about it. Like the first 30 minutes without any dialogue is just so unique. It was... It's hey, such a no great. spoilers. <laughs> Did you see the Saturday Night Live spoof on it? It's very no, seriously. Oh, well, you've got to see it. No. It's about 
uh, Kanye or something like that. And it, you got to see it. Okay, Look at it. Cool. It's very funny. Um, the other thing is I've been trying to do some reorganization, like because I'm self-employed and I do quite a few different activities. I mean, I'm involved in three different um, uh, conferences and then I do courses and then I do workshops and stuff. I just have a lot of things going on. And so I've been having some problems. I've been using um, Kanban flow to kind of manage all my to-do tasks. Plus I have to do a lot of stuff with my parents managing their finances for them. And I just felt like it was getting overwhelming. And it just wasn't a good organization tool. So I've been trying some other things. And one tool that I started using that I'm really impressed with is called Notion. It's a notion.so. And it's kind of a, it's an interesting, almost wiki, like you can create in place, but it has organization to it. And including you can have Kanban boards. So I've created a bunch of little small Kanban boards, but it could also create calendars and stuff. It's super, super cool. And there's quite a few videos on various things. And then the other one, which is even simpler than Kanban Flow, which is also very interesting, is Workflowy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's at first glance, Workflowy seems pretty simple, but then I started watching their videos and other people, like some random um, chiropractor, figured out a way to get Workflowy to work as a tickle file, where you can put in tags and then create search strings that he can then grab the URLs and put them into his Workflowy document as notes. So you can click this link and it'll show him everything that he said, hey, I want to follow up within one day on this or within seven days. And it'll say, oh, you haven't touched that item in seven days. So it's time for you to follow up. Oh, wow. And like super innovative, <laughs> right? How his approach was like, wow, almost mind blowing. So workflow is so much more powerful than it at first seems, but yet super simple and super easy to work with right at the beginning. So I'm really impressed with both tools, Notion and Workflow. And those are my picks. Awesome. Alyssa, what are your picks? Um, so a couple of shout outs for courses that I either love the instructor or recently taken the course and love. So on Udemy, um, Masha Mahdi um, has some really cool courses on um, Angular. He's got like a quick like Angular crash course for busy developers. And then he also has like a longer one. And I don't know if you guys have ever had this moment when you're like listening to someone talk and it's just like the way they think and like the way their brain flows is exactly the paths your brain takes. But I had that with Mosh and have just absolutely loved like anytime I have spare time just checking in with anything new he has. So love that dude on Udemy. And then Deborah Carada has a new course on NGRX. And I've been walking through that as I learn all of the fun Reduxy, RxJS, Reactive Programming things. And it's been really um, a very powerful tool. So yeah, those are the two picks I have this week. Nice. Shai, what are your picks? Nice. Okay. So um, I want to jump in and also say that uh, I recommend Workflow and also written a Chrome extension for it that helps you manage uh, your sprints. So it shows you a sum of all the estimated time and show you the total time spent and all that stuff. I'm going to release it. So it's not out there yet. So I, I will pick it again when, <laughs> when it's released. Another pick is a um, library called Pect, uh, uh, JS, which is the library for doing contract testing. Um, if you don't know what it is, check it out. It's super cool. And it basically removes uh, or reduces the, amount of integration tests that you need to write. Um, and my last pick is, um, so <clears throat> I've been focusing more on testing and testing Angular applications uh, in recent months. Uh, and I'm basically uh, bought the domain testangular.com and I'm going to um, give there uh, a free uh, uh, workshop uh, and also I have, um, the, the, the free TDD theory course. Uh, so everything is towards, uh, testing. Uh, so my main goal now is to make, take people that, um, haven't got a clue, uh, about, uh, how to test their code or they try to test and, and, and got to, you know, um, uh, failing tests or, you know, uh, just not knowing how to, you know, uh, make them run faster or they keep breaking or all this stuff and to take them into a bliss of writing their test and having like 
uh, high coverage for their code and stuff like that. So check out testangular.com. I will have their like a free workshop that you can take. And, um, and yeah, those are my picks. Oh, that sounds cool. I'll have to come visit it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, on the other hand, have only frivolous picks. Um, it, I somehow got caught up with the na- um, National Wiffle Ball League Championships. Um, uh, now, <laughs> I didn't actually believe there was such a thing. Um, it's like a National Tiddlywinks Championship, but there, um, they, there are people who actually play wiffle ball seriously. Um, and one of my favorite teams is the Brew City Wiffle Ball Keg Crushers. So, um, in case that um, kind of amuses you too, or you really don't have enough to do and need some more time wasters, uh, we'll have that in the show notes. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how seriously to take that, but. Well, you know, I got to meet Sluggo Flanagan, for example. I got to find out. What... Nice. It, it it's totally ridiculous. It may <laughs> just take over from my affection for how to sharpen a pencil. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to jump in with a few picks. Um, so the last couple of weeks, I've been working on my yard. Um, you know, the, the the place where you're supposed to have grass. Um, and it's actually kind of funny because uh, we we basically just completely eradicated our entire lawn because it was mostly weeds and uh, started over. And it, it looks way better now. <laughs> oh, and we haven't put grass down yet. I was telling my wife, I was like, it's really sad to me that it looks better than it did when it had grass. Um, but anyway, so a few things that uh, I've really uh, liked um, just, just to pull that together is... Uh, we went down to Home Depot and we got some uh, their their blocks for retaining walls, and so they've got a little uh, ledge on the back that you know helps hold the the wall together and puts the pressure on the brick or blocks below it to you know to hold its shape. And uh, we built a little planter in front of our house with those. Um, they also have some. Uh, it's made out of kind of rubber or plastic, and it's just kind of the edging for like gardens and stuff got a whole bunch of that and uh, anyway I've, I've kind of uh, realized that a I, I like landscaping but I don't like it in in such large doses so uh, if the world ends and I can no longer be a programmer or podcaster landscaper is not in my job description but um, you know it has been uh, kind of fun to be able to see the yard start to take shape so um, anyway uh, you know Home Depot's got all of that stuff but I'll, and, and I'll put links to like the the retaining wall blocks and stuff that we got. But anyway, um, that, that's just been uh, kind of something that I've been spending a lot of time on lately. And then uh, the other thing is, and I know that some of our listeners to some of the shows are podcasters. I've been working on a system for podcasters that help manage the uh, workflows for things like the content and uh, the RSS feeds and things like that. And I'm getting to the point where I would actually like to have some users uh, jump in and use it. Um, eventually I'm probably going to charge. No, I'm prob- not probably. Eventually I'm going to charge people to use it. But for right now, I'll probably just set you up with a free account and, uh, you know, let you manage your content through it. Um, so if you're interested in that, send me an email, Chuck at devchat.tv. And yeah, that, that's, that's what I've got. Um, well, it's been fun getting to 200 guys. Woohoo! Yay. And, uh, you know, here's to 200 more. <laughs> yep. Keep it up. Thanks, Jeff. Yep, we'll see y'all next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C A C H E F L Y dot com to learn more.